but these are kind of theoretical and they, uh, in order for us to really understand how this can work in practice, we have uh, Mr. Sidi Jallo uh, who can, um, will now talk about how this EMIS shift thinking has been really, um, the Gambia has actually, uh, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education in the Gambia has been at the forefront in, in the continent of, uh, of Africa to think how can we actually uh, affect this shift. Uh, so please, uh, CD, over to you. Thanks. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. So um, I think um, we are very happy, the Gambia team and you know, the rest of the DHISO group, including Jerry his, um, from his person Central Africa, that the effort that the Gambia has been doing in terms of um, the attendance system has really um, reverberated with you. And um, we are very happy to say that we are, our doors are open, please, um, at any moment during coffee, during tea, during lunch, anytime, even when you are walking outside, please approach us talk to Ross, and then we would be able to explore more about what we, take, um, what we are doing. And in the, in, sorry, there's a small issue with the timer. <laughs> yes. So, um, the daily attendance system is just one of um, the key things that the HIS2 has helped us um, digitize in the country, in the Gambia. We will talk about the second one, that is the school report card in, in the other presentation. But the main reason why the Gambia has shifted to um, the HIS2 is because we wanted to undergo this shift that Kunut has just spoken about. And this shift is because of many reasons. One, he said, he explained, he touched on the fact that in education systems, we had a lot of data, we collect a lot of data. But all of the dimensions that he mentioned, education systems in general, have shortcomings in all of those areas. So we want to show you the big motivations that the Gambia had when it, tried, when it tries to shift from aggregate to individual, from annual census to um, individual level data, so that you can understand. And I'm sure Sri Lanka and many other education systems, Eswatini, and every other people that are here, you can relate to the Gambian story. So I hope you'll be able to draw parallels with what, we, uh, what I'm coming to say. So first we talk about the objectives. That is the reasons why we are um, doing the shift in the Gambia, what motivated us. And we'll talk about some of the current activities that we have in the Gambia. But it's also important to talk about the key structures the, for the, inform, the supporting structures that we have to leverage on in order to make this um, a possibility. And then we talk about some of the challenges and some of the lessons that we have learned throughout this, this, this journey. So first, let's start with the vision. Why exactly are we doing this as a country in the Gambia? Um, I really want to tell you more about the Gambia, but I think I will leave Dr. Pamut to, he has a lot, so much experience about the Gambia. You can talk about the demography, you know, the social and cultural environment of the Gambia to them, because this presentation really has to be, <laughs> it's going to be deep, and I really want us to focus more on uh, exactly what the Gambia is. Sorry, there's supposed to be a timeline there. So um, this circular timeline, because of the graphic issue, is supposed to denote our collection cycle, starting in November, where we, in every year, that is the annual school census cycle, where we collect aggregate data. We always start in November, collect statistics. We down here, usually by February, we would generate what we call provisional results. And this provisional data from the summaries that we collect is usually what is used to inform some basic interventions. And then reports or the final statistics is always generated in May. So it's like one, almost one year after the collections. At, at the end of the academic year, that is when MS, this MS data is always available. And that 
is a kind of emissensor form that we have um, that um, uh, for a lower basic school, just giving you some a snapshot of the kind of um, systems that we are using, a paper base. And we also do sometimes give out feedback to the schools, but it's always one year late. The feedback that you are seeing there at the behind gives a summary of the data that the school has provided us in addition to um, the district's levels, aggregation, and stuff. So the Gambia has been doing this consistently, all from 2014 all the way to, to now. Every year, we are consistent. We produce this without delay and on time. So we had so much time doing this that we now started generating a different kind of output, summarizing this whole for the, um, for the um, not the technical users, because the first demographs was the first production was mostly tables, but this one is a summary, it's a report that try to explain the kind of things that we, um, we have, um, these key insights that we have in this each year to, that we need to focus on as a sector. And then because of that, we've, um, because of the level of quality of data that we have used, we've started using it in models, in models. That is to predict what kind of um, decisions that we can, we can make out of this to predict, you know, uh, events. For example, we have a policy of totally, we talked about double shifting. In the Gambia, we had the policy of we need to remove this double shifting because we, we, uh, it's affecting learning in the classrooms. And we talked about the learning crisis um, yesterday. But the problem is, right now, if you re want to remove the double shifting, that means you need to construct extra classrooms. That means you need to train extra teachers. That means you need to make sure that they have enough salaries. That means you know, uh, the classrooms need to be furnished, and you need to also take care of the load of the, um, of the teachers, because you don't want to remove the teachers, uh, double shifting, and then add more load to the teachers, which is also going to remove. So we had to do all of these projections. And this projection also came to maybe, I think our proudest moment in this was in COVID. You talked about the health interventions during COVID. In the, in the education sector, also in the Gambia, during COVID, we also had models. And these models, what they did was, they came up, you know, tried to tell us everything about social distancing. What would happen if we decide to split our classes instead of 45 to 25? Because we thought that was the only way to operate within, within COVID, which was done by many countries. But that also has repercussions. That means you need extra classes. That means you need to find print space for those classes. And then you need to make sure more teachers are available, furniture, and look at it. But most of these are physical facilities that you cannot easily expand. So we need to look at what arrangements can we do in each of these schools to be able to um, go ahead with this um, social distancing in classroom. And we were able to do this modeling down up to the school level. And we were able to, up to the school level, that was how good our data, aggregate data was. And we were able to identify 22 schools out of the whole country, 24 schools that we are really, really complex cases. None of the scenarios that we um, foresaw or that we suggested was suitable for any of them. So we had to look for a special arrangement for, for them. So this is how good our aggregate data was. But with all this, we really had some shortcomings because we could not... <laughs> The funny thing about um, this, all of this modeling, we do this, they gave us hand washing facilities and everything at the school. But when it was time to reopen, or it was time to plan for the students, we did not know the first thing about the student. We knew everything about the school. We were able to model for the schools, but we did not know anything about the students. So because of that, we were given an offer as a ministry. Please tell us the number of, um, because we don't want the students to be competing in, um, in a socially distanced public transport system. They cannot compete with adults. So we need to give them public buses. But how many public buses do we need? We realize that we don't know where these children are coming from because we are only interested in the school. We are not interested in the children. So because of this, we could not open on time. So we had to delay our COVID openings. And due, because of that, you know, um, a lot of learning was lost, as uh, you've seen also in the case of Uganda. So because of this, um, the MS, we really, the ministry said, no, we need to move away. We cannot continue doing this. And as a result, um, the education policy has always been talking about how do we need to improve the MS to go individual. And that is why the vision of the MS shift is in line with what um, 
Kunut has talked about, and yesterday what many presenters talked about. For example, our coverage doesn't include assessment data, most of the assessment data, doesn't include non-formal, doesn't include socio-economic demographic data for us to answer where the children are coming from. Decentralization, right now, everything that is being done in MS is done by the national team, and we are just a handful. All the skills, all the capacity, all the resources is at the national level. And we forget that EMIS means Education Management Information System. And we forget that this education management is, doesn't talk about the national managers. It also talks about the school managers. So this is always something that we forgot. And that's one of the things that was also discussed in this panel of the head teachers that we are here. Then we talk about integration, availability. Again, the same problem like Kunut talked about. Frequency. You collect annual census data in November. It will not be available until May. And the schools are closing in the Gambia in June. So um, the granularity, yes, headcount, you, when, you when you count headcounts, you are like you are saying the specialist student and the um, other students are all the same, which is not ex exactly, um, which is problematic. That means you are totally disregarding the kind of special assistance that the specialist people need. So what is our plan? In order to do this, we definitely relate again to the discussion that we've been having here, especially the panel. And I was very happy um, with the panel discussion yesterday. And the key thing was we always forget about where the data is generated from. And somebody made a very important point that anytime we say we need to collect data, we go back to the, the, the schools and then we generate new data generation tools. We would create a new form for individual, for example. Please give us all the forms. But we forget that the easiest way is to digitize the process. Digitize the process. And digitizing the process, that means information is going to be a natural byproduct. And a natural byproduct means that the, the, the schools don't need to spend an extra effort in order to generate that. And in a way, you are also making themselves. Into it. This is not definitely easy, but this should be the best way that we should approach. And as a result, we have a whole you know, student management component that tells about what we want you know, in this computerized school-based system that is supposed to digitize the process at the school. We talk about the teacher management component and how this teacher component at the level of the school is supposed to feed the regional um, teachers so that the teachers, you can post teachers at will and based on requirements and you can gather all of this inside. And then school administration routines because there's a lot of other administrative process that also goes in the school. And these are some things that we are like, you know, managing of um, classrooms, managing of the resources that are there. These are daily responsibilities that the um, uh, school teachers deal with every day. So, but also it's important to be pragmatic and be frugal, also something that has been discussed. This is a grand plan, and digitizing schools is not an easy thing, but is the best way to go. But we have to also be very real about the possibilities and the limitations that we have, and it has to be one step at a time. So, what have we done? With all these plans, what have we done as a country in, in the Gambia? First, the first thing was we started this collaboration with UIO in 2019. In 2021, after COVID came and we were given the shock of our lives, we had this um, phase where like, you know, we need to register everyone in the country, get their demographics aside. Then we'll be able to plan based on that if anything like COVID happens again. And that was what we did in in 2021, where we went around or the, or every country using the regional officers and the planning officers, and then we collect individual level data on forms. But that's, and it was good because we were at least, um, in most of the country, we got around uh, approximately 70% 70, 70 of the population of the Gambia was covered in this. So that tells you the level of difficulty that you are going to face if you want to go individual. And if you want to go ad drop, it has to be systematic and it has to be something that has to be routinely done. So this was in 2021. We got a snapshot and we were able to analyze um, based on that. Um, and then the second thing what that we did was in 2022, that was with the help of um, um, the whole education project here, we designed what a school-based image in a way. That's what we call the CIMIS, student, school, and uh, staff management component that we call the CIMIS. And the CIMIS, as the Gambia, we say, we are looking at digitizing the process. So we went to the school, we spoke to the head teachers, we looked at how they do their work, we tried to see how we can generate the outputs with the support of the resources that have done. So you see, 
the two schools that this one was piloted in, we went to 5,500. Uh, uh, um, in total, we, were, we worked with 5,500 students, 200 teachers in total. We had three weeks intense you know, um, investigation in these schools to understand exactly what is, is to happen. And the idea was to follow the school process. And then we stress test the SEMIS. The SEMIS was based on you know, our experience. We have been doing a lot of research in, in SEMIS. Now we want to understand exactly how you know, that works, whether our approach was OK. And then we also what we call the VPN infrastructure. We'll talk about the VPN infrastructure in a moment. So this was also accompanied by research. And then, you know, as you can see, both the mobile device um, system of the SEMIS and the web-based SEMIS has been tested in depth at this school during this, during this time. And the outcome was finally we were able to you know, understand what they realized, and then we were able to finally, for the first time, generate what we call an individual ID for the students to mark that, at least in one school, we have been able to go through the process, understand what it requires to register students from the beginning, and then have them in the system, and then give them something that they can move it along in, this, in the system. So, but in order to do this, we need some kind of um, structures that, 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 needs to, um, support, that, that needs to enable this. And one thing was, one, um, there definitely needs to be budgets. There needs to be funds for this. In the Gambia, we have limited government funds because we are in a you know, low-income country. But also, we have um, um, most of our support are coming from donor funds. That is why in order to scale, we were only starting in, in two. In, in order to scale, we really need to make sure that these interventions are sustainable. And that is one of the reasons why we went with DHISU, because we, this kind of vendor lock-in that most of the other countries find themselves in, we are very pragmatic about that. We don't want to find ourselves in that kind of situation. And DHISU, in addition to be not because of the low cost of the system and the capacity in built capacity building. You don't need ex ex external experts to handle the system for you. You can, most of those costs can be taken off. So the other cost that you, that you take care of is the devices, is the network infrastructure that you can handle as a government if, you, or if, um, if the infrastructure is cheap enough. And also the research component is important because all that we do, we do it, um, can I, can I, my time is of five minutes? Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so in anything, so we, what we do is, um, in terms of res, um, uh, research, it's also important that whatever you do is informed. And that is why we had a lot of research visits, you know, from master students, from my own research at the University of Oslo is around this, and also to make sure that we have research and practice you know, at the school to understand what exactly is, is going. So then we talk about also the human capacity building. I, was, I talked about my, you know, PhD program and how the formal training, the academics that we're at, attending like this is very important in making sure that we build capacity in order to do this. We share innovations and, and things like that. And we also have a whole, while we are designing this, we also have a whole idea around a university program similar to what um, Sri Lanka has in health that is trying to train officers in, in the university so that they can maintain the systems. Because when you are shifting, remember I said our MS is mostly skills, we are mostly at the national level. You need to make sure that skills are available all the way, you know, in the case of Sri Lanka, from provincial to, you know, to the zonal, to the district, up to the schools. You have to have personnel at all of these levels that need to support the system. But let's also not forget about, you know, the institutional issue. We have a very, you know, good, good support from our institution. And our administrative structure is such that we have access to everything. That's one good thing about the Gambia. Our structures are not very, very decentralized. In a way, it's good you know, if you want to scale something. But in a way, it's also bad if you want to you know, maintain it as an individual system. But again, the technical the software and the devices and the connectivity. So one of the, um, the in terms of the connectivity, the Gambia came up you know, with a lot of discussions. Somebody, other countries that have um, um, started uh, to pilot, they already use what they call the VPN. The VPN is just a limited access to the internet, and which we find as a country something that is very cost effective as opposed to the open internet and allows every school 
to be able to access these systems without interruptions, without network challenges, and they will be able to, um, it's just based on in, uh, network coverage, and we have found this to work in both schools that we have um, gone to, and it's cheap and cost effective. So what are some of the key lessons? One, the semis works, um, which is one of the things, and the second thing is we need to prioritize you know, the needs of the schools, like we, like we discussed, and listen to them, talk to them, write as, much notes, as many notes as you can, don't just go there because you want to collect, go there because you want to solve their problem. So maintain the student list is the foundation. Go in individual, forget about attendance, forget about you know, um, assessment if your student list is not maintained, if your student list is not updated, because every year it needs to be, it needs to be cleaned, it needs to be updated. So maintain the student list is a very important you know, takeaway that we got from here. So digitalization shouldn't necessarily increase the workload of the teachers. So please, let's, let's, let's look at it that way. It shouldn't necessarily, we shouldn't say we digitize so the teachers have to do extra work. There's always some other things that we can do. Again, you know, these are some of the key challenges, but then we have some broader challenges that we also need to deal with that um, we can maybe go out at our own time. So on that note, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention, and um, I will hope we'll have the opportunity to talk about you know, this um, on so many other occasions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sidi. Um, I think we will also be able to take some questions after the next presentation. So if there's any questions, please feel free to write those down and keep them for, for Sidi. So moving on to a, a very, very connected topic, um, we would like to invite Mr. Mfanukona Nkambule from the Ministry of Education and Training, Eswatini. He is um, an EMIS IT administrator. Um, has, who has been a key and critical part of the, the pilots and the work being done in Eswatini. So please welcome, help me welcome Mr. Nkambule to the stage. <laughs> 